I thought we were going to have a conversation solely focused on your new building, which is the A-frame that you're building. But I just learned some crazy news. Uh, since the last time we spoke, something wild happened to you. And if you could just just tell us what, what happened and what's going on. Catch yeah, sure. Up. So good to see you again, Jamie. Thanks for having me on. Last time we met, we were, um, you, were came, you came to the property, you explored the cabins I had. We had a great interview then. And I was in the process of going to build my fourth cabin. So when I decided to do that, I thought, you know, this is getting pretty big. Maybe I should go to my town and just tell them what's going on and make sure I'm, you know, legit and, and whatnot. So when I did that and I said, yeah, this is what I'm doing, they were very surprised. And they said, oh, we have to have a look at this. And they came and they had a look and they said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't tell us about this. You, you need to get permits. You need to do this. So, you know, I thought before someone would squeal on me or my neighbor would squeal on me, I would just volunteer the information. And I did it at a time that was not the best, but not the worst. So I did it in like very, very early spring of last year. Um, and it wasn't a problem with my town. They said, it's, it, we're happy to have you do this, but you need to, you know, make a site plan and get the building permits and such. So I was shut down for about two months and that delayed the A-frame uh, construction, of course. But after the two months, which wasn't that long, we were back in business and construction continued and I could open up my other cabin. So I was shut down like for April and May. So before the real busy season came. And um, so, yeah, luckily you were shut down before busy season. You've been in the game long enough that you know when busy season hits um, and when busy season does hit, it goes crazy. I mean, most people that run glamping businesses make the lion's share of their money for the business within like a three to four month period, um, even those that are uh, open all year long. But can you tell us what it was like being shut down? Because that is everyone's biggest fear. Um, and it seems like it might be happening more and more, but can you tell us what it was like learning that you were going to be shut down and then let us know what steps you needed to take? Like you said, there were steps mm -hmm. that needed to be taken. What were those steps? Yeah, I was I was really surprised because as as you saw, my area is very rural, so, somewhat similar to yours. I'm just surrounded by farmland. Um, there isn't much going on in, in my little dirt road as it is. So I thought it was just going to be let them know what's going on. And they would say, OK, you know, we just want to know about it. But they said you need a, a site plan, which was the main thing. And a site plan basically means you have to draw a layout of your property exactly where each building is, exactly the size of each building, how far away it is from the road, can an uh, ambulance or fire truck pull into the driveway? Um, what is your, yeah, we went into how do you supply some water? How do you deal with the septic? So I had to spell that all out with the porta potties and I use, you know, captured rainwater. So it just was, you had to cross all your T's and dot all your I's and that was pretty much that part. Um, and then the second part was the building permits. And I still have my building still less than that 144 square foot. So that wasn't really the biggest issue, but the site plan was. And that involved going to the board meeting, which happens once every month typically. So in the first board meeting, I submitted my plans. There's like a board of directors. They look at it. They ask me a bunch of questions like, um, you know, can a fire truck go? And I think they even sent the fire chief and drove by and he just had a look to make sure my driveway was wide enough, which mm -hmm. they did. And then, you know, the next meeting and the next month I got the stamp and that was it. They were like, go oh, have fun. <laughs> wow. Okay. So <laughs> I think that it wasn't that, I mean, it's, that doesn't sound like it was that difficult for you. Do you think that is because you're in a more rural area? Cause sometimes Absolutely. people will reach out to me. Yeah. Sometimes people will reach out to me for advice on buying land and they're saying the prices are too expensive or the town will never let it happen. And I'll look at where they're trying to start a glamping business or where they're buying land. And I'm like, you're in the middle of a town. There's, there's a high school next door. Like that's, they're never going to let that fly. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the process was a little quick and kind of simple for you. you. You, you agree with that, that it's because you're in a more rural location. Yeah. A very rural location. Um, and also they told me you're the first again in this, um, industry, you know, there mm -hmm. was, a, there was, so there wasn't really many rules about it. And, mm -hmm. and they were saying there's a second person who wants to do something similar in like the next town over, but it's still mm -hmm. part of the same County. So, they weren't exactly involved, but they knew about it, but they couldn't even check with them. Like, how did you guys do it? So I was mm -hmm. kind of like the guinea pig of, of my area for this. And uh, it, yeah, it, it was pretty easy. 
Um, but again, I, they made it sound a lot worse in the beginning. You know, okay. I got this official letter in the mail that said, you must cease uh, doing your business. And, and, and if you don't, we're going to, you know, take you to court. And, and that must've been very scary. It was, I, mean, I would be scared. <laughs> <laughs> it was because like I guess I really wasn't expecting it because you know, my neighbor who has had a farm there for like the past 75 years, mm -hmm. she always told me that whenever something came up like that and they would just build barns, you know, in the 50s and 60s, nobody checked anything. And Those were the always, good old days. The good old days. And they always said, build whatever you want. You know, you have 200 acres. And so I just, uh, and the other funny thing is that as rural as my area is, my little dirt road, there's actually like two other home businesses that are going mm -hmm. on anyway and mm -hmm. one started more than 15 years ago it was like a farm that turned a, a renovated an old um, house into a cafe uh, okay. it was even written about in new york times as one of the top five organic cafes in the country wow. so it wasn't like no one had heard of bringing business to our little town or our little dirt road it was it was mm -hmm. going on really for for years it just um and when everybody starts doing it, I guess <laughs> they say, yeah. well, why are you doing it? Well, they're doing it. So why can't I do it? I mean, not the same business, but yeah. And, and post COVID now more people are working from home. So it seems to be the trend anyway. Absolutely. So going back to something that you said that I don't want to jump over, cause I'm certain that the people listening probably are curious about these things. Um, going back to the site plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're an architect. I don't know if you're super tech savvy. I don't know what's, secret skills you have, because I've spoken to you and you've lived many lives and you know, you've excelled <laughs> at many different things. But w did you do the site plan on your own? Did you need to get assistance for that? How did you have that happen? And also specifically throughout this entire process, did you need a lawyer? Never needed a lawyer. In fact, most things I do in life where I'm supposed to have a lawyer, I don't get uh -huh. a lawyer. I just do it myself because um, if it's my own business and no one's going to really probably pay more attention to my own business than myself. So I've always done things myself and I didn't get a lawyer for this. Uh, I may have maybe the first two or three days reached out to a bunch just in case uh, I thought I needed them. But once mm -hmm. I realized the, what the situation was, I thought I can handle this. And yeah, having many hats back in the day when I first started college, I was going to go to school for to be an architect or uh, AutoCAD. I took classes in AutoCAD and drafting oh, okay. and I ended up getting an art degree. So I have that creative um, skill. Mm -hmm. So it just was a matter of me going. I got a large uh, like 11 by 17 graph paper and a good ruler. And I just every square was my whatever five feet or 10 feet, whatever it was. And it just came out to scale. I used colored pencils to make the stream in blue and the road in brown and labeled everything and they were happy with it and they were actually pretty impressed i think they would have accepted something like done on loose leaf paper as long as it okay. was clear so yeah. again you know when i say i have a small town there's probably you know less than two thousand people that live in this town so it's not okay like okay cool so so you got so back to the beginning you started uh your glamping business uh by accident uh you built a really cool uh 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 Greenhouse. glass house greenhouse uh uh and you know you kind of expanded from there from after that you built two more tiny homes um they were doing really great on airbnb um and being put out there you got a ton of press um and now you're building your uh a-frame and that's kind of what how you got into all of this um but so that's just catching people up on where you were moving forward though when you had to go through this process with the uh speaking to the town you have a pretty unique setup when it comes to uh, the septic system or like, you know, like water um, and, and the septic system that you have. They didn't have any issues with you using uh, porta potties or anything like that, because that is such a unique way. And I've, I've highlighted that before on my channel about just you in particular and how you do that. Uh, they had no issues with that. No, they actually love the porta party idea because there wasn't anything that would harm our environment in any way. Um, so that part was great. The part that they didn't like, believe it or not, was my uh, Echo outdoor bathtubs and the fact that I have a little like uh, each cabin has a little sink and under the sink, there's a, like a five gallon bucket. So if they brush their teeth or wash their hands, whatever water collects in the bucket, um, 
you know, I just would splash in, in the forest mm -hmm. or in the grass because it was never more than like a gallon. And mm -hmm. that was like one of the biggest issues they had was like, oh, you can't just be throwing that gray water into your, you know, into mm. the forest. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. It's, it, you would think gray water would be perfectly fine. It's not black water. I mean, but, yeah. But still such a small amount. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they said, you have to figure out a way to deal with that. And I thought, well, what if I just uh, take that water and dump it into the porta potty? And they said, yeah, that will work. As long as the porta potty <laughs> company is okay with you adding sink water to it, then that's fine. So I had to go to the porta potty right, and say, can you send me a letter saying that it's okay that I put some gray water from the sinks of each cabin into your porta potty? And they said, yeah, that's fine. And they wrote up a letter. So that was part of the you know, folder that I submitted with the site plan approved. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it seems like you really were going for it. And I think that a lot of people, and I hope I'm not one of those YouTube channels that are promoting that, that say starting a glamping business is easy because it absolutely isn't. Um, it's extremely fulfilling. Uh, there's a great ROI on your investments, to be honest. Uh, but that being said, it's not easy and simple. So, you know, you're going through it and I'm hearing and I'm like, yeah, you were able to get through the process rather um straightforward but it seems like you were very diligent in like crossing your t's and dotting your i's and making this work for you i think a lot of people get very nervous and scared the second that like me me personally i have to admit the second i got that letter in the mail i would have just been like oh man i would have called my mother said it's all over mom you know what i mean so um can you can you talk about more of the ins and outs in the process because you brought up that one issue that they didn't like can you say anything else about when you were speaking with them back and forth because it doesn't sound like they were just really trying to shut you down it sounds yeah. like they were trying to work with you and figure out what this business is and how can we have this in our area yeah they were it was it's almost like if you if you think of the situation when you're a little kid and you and you do something wrong like you take the cookie from the cookie jar and your mother and father ask you did you take that cookie and if you try to lie and say, mm -mm, I didn't take it, you get in more trouble, right? So if mm -hmm. you say, yeah, I took the cookie and they say, all right, you know, you know, you're not supposed to take it unless it's kind of was like the same parental um, mm -hmm. speech that they gave me. Like, well, we know now that we know you're doing it, it just would have been better if you came to us in the beginning. But now that we know, let's work together. So they even they actually gave me good advice. They said, well, how big do you want to make your your lampsite eventually and mm -hmm. i said well i have i have four acres which isn't a lot but it's it's not a small amount and i thought well maybe i could go up to nine or ten and they said all right that's fine so why don't you plan that all out now in that on that graph paper and then in the future even though if you don't do it this year or next year once we approve it it's like in stone so in the years to come if you want to add four or five more you can so initially i did do that uh -huh. but um then <laughs> For some reason, when I had an issue, when I was trying to find out what to do with that gray water from the sink, somehow I had to make a phone call to, I forget who it was, something with the New York State Department of Con Conservation or whoever it was. But I spoke to someone who really knew more about this than the people in my town. And what I learned is that for New York State, with what I was doing, I could have up to four sites, four, mm -hmm. this was the exact uh, way he put it, four campsites before you had to make some investment in a water uh, system, septic system that wasn't porta potty, meaning you okay. would need to have like real, uh, real toilets, flushing toilets, a where to uh, a septic to catch all that. So, but if you're under four campgrounds, it wasn't an issue. So you don't need to have anything. I okay. had planned out the my original drawing was I had like five more spots that kept going into the forest. And mm -hmm. once I had the conversation with, with him and then my town guys found out about it, I thought, well, all right, I'll just keep it at the four because that's what everybody's agreeing on and yeah. that's how it stands. Okay. And then throughout the process, was there anything else that really like that you learned throughout the process that really like shocked you or like that you really didn't know of before going into it that you learned through the process? Just because it seems like more and more people are going to have to be going through these processes in, in their areas. And I know it changes from town to town, let alone state to state, but town to town. But it's always great to hear about other people's experiences as we all plan and get ready to go through the gauntlet ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... Um... The part about where when I spoke to this other fella with the New York State uh, Conservation, uh, that was really almost opening up a can of worms that I, I didn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to open 
but mm -hmm. I was I wanted to get as much information as possible. And he was almost ready to say, well, maybe we need to come out and have a look at your um, setup. Yeah, and that I definitely did not want. And I said, oh, uh -huh. no, no, we're, we're going <laughs> to cap it for don't worry. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm doing the site plan for. And somehow that guy and the, the few people on my board, they did have a quick conversation. So they knew that and mm -hmm. that's how they knew that I couldn't have like 10 sites planned out on my my property unless I was going to invest in that septic system. Okay. So, so yeah. So, you know, you, <laughs> if you open a can of worms, you never know how many yeah. worms are going to be in there. But, Absolutely. But still now I know and, and I feel confident going forward that I've seen like I've talked to everybody I needed to. There's no more surprises. If And now that I know that rule about my particular area, if I want to do have more cabins, I just have to get another piece of land and probably I could do the same hack as just get another piece of property, max out at cap four. Cap it at four. Yeah. Buy another piece of property five miles away, cap it out at four. Yeah. And so with these conversations that were being had, I guess the person from New York State was over the phone or maybe via email, but with your local township, were these conversations had in person? Were they over the phone? You know, because I'm thinking about like getting dressed. Um, to go speak to the board of directors of my town and like, you know, the worries, the worries that can come from that. So were those conversations in person and kind of what was the tone and the vibe of those conversations when they were being had? The um, um, the main person on my board, he's an older old timer type of guy. He's probably been doing it longer than I've lived in the property, which is 25 years. So mm -hmm. I just send him a random email because every year we deal with him, you know, they send you like some forms and at tax time. So you're, we know who we, we, who each of us are. Mm -hmm. And I just sent him a quick email saying, Hey, is it okay if I'm doing this? And he said, Oh, yes, it is. As long as you meet um, the requirements. And then I didn't really do anything about it. But after that um, initial email, he drove by because he didn't mm -hmm. live very far away. And then he saw what was going on. And then I, I forget if he, now, he probably emailed me back saying, I drove by, he took pictures, he attached the pictures of my building sites of the A-frame mm -hmm. and the buildings that were already there. And he said, and that's when that conversation got a little like, uh-uh, uh, okay. uh And then um, he emailed me what I would need to do as far as, uh, you know, rectifying the situation. And I had his phone number. It's a local, like, you know, local local phone, local person, local phone mm -hmm. number. I spoke to him once or twice, maybe. And he said, come to the meeting. It's uh, in two weeks. So I came to the meeting. So I'm in person. So it was a, it was a variety to answer your question. Okay. It was phone calls. It was emails. Yeah. It was in person. Um, and, you know, after they got over the initial shock of what I was doing, mm -hmm. they liked the idea. Again, it's not like other people weren't doing business from their homes in the area. So... Okay, cool. And then what was the price, do you think, of getting into this whole debacle, keeping the building of the A-frame out of it? It, does, did it? it doesn't seem like you actually had to come out of pocket with any new funds. I don't see anything here because you didn't hire a lawyer. You didn't need a zoning expert. You kind of uh, handled everything yourself and spoke directly to the town. Yeah, it didn't cost a penny you know, wow. as far as doing what they needed. But I lost two months of income from the cabins, which hurt. And, and on a good month, your cabins, do you know how much just on one month? Because uh, you have three sites now, you're building your fourth. Yeah, well, April is not really a big month. May, because I missed out like on Labor Day, um, I'm sorry, Memorial Day and, you know, the beginning of spring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was probably out in four to 5,000 maybe. For okay. Okay. The end of April, beginning of May. Okay, cool, cool. And then... Um, oh, no, it's not cool. <laughs> you're, you know what? You're very right. You know? <laughs> you're very right. Because, um, yeah, definitely. I think sometimes people think that... And I probably say this too. I, I tell people glamping businesses won't make you rich. One, glamping business won't make you rich. Two to three, though, once you start having multiple doors and, and, and you, you, know, you add that density to your glamp site, that's when you can start getting profitable. So speaking about... Uh, prices let's talk about your operation right now um i haven't been there in over a year i'm excited to to come back uh, later this this spring and this summer but you have three uh glamp sites you have the uh glass house or the greenhouse uh and you have two uh tiny homes 
kind of catch us up on your entire operation. Uh, and also the question that everyone's thinking about is on a good month, how much do you think that you're bringing in? Like how much do you expect to bring in this summer? Okay. Yeah. So we're still running with the three cabins. Uh, the original cabin, the, the sun barn, which was the greenhouse, that still is the, the main draw of, of the, of the glamp grounds. So that's still my most profitable one. And, um, say July and August, like those two months, that one usually can bring in between 4,000, 4,500 a month. The other two tiny cabins in those prime months, they don't do as good. They usually hover around three, 3,000 to 3,500. Mm -hmm. And the A-frame I'm expecting to do probably, I'm going to say about the same as the two tiny houses. Hopefully if, if, if it meets expectations, it might do as well as the Sun Barn because, yeah, it's an A-frame. Um, it has some special features in it. And um, one, one of the special features, actually, is it's going to be handicap accessible. Awesome. So the, the A-frame is, is about 120 feet from the road in a forest that goes downhill. And I always thought if I did build a cabin in the forest, how would people get to it? Because it's, it's very rough terrain and, you know, at night and when it's dark. And I just didn't see a way that people could do it safely. So I thought the safest way even for anybody is with like a, a walk bridge, mm -hmm. a bridge that actually goes through the forest. And I thought it would look cool and it would be cool. And then it would have that extra advantage is that, it, you know, a person with, with uh, you know, physical dis disability or in a wheelchair could actually use the A-frame. Um, and that's one of the things that I think will make it more, yeah, th more interesting. That's for... awesome. Cause I don't think a lot of glamping businesses, I mean, it's, it's something that's a little difficult to um, really bake in a ton of accessibility just because it's out in the wilderness, it's out in the wild, you know, it's like, and you also don't want to disrupt the natural flow of like the forest as much as possible. So I think that is something that's extremely unique. And also maybe something that people should think about, especially if they have multiple glamping sites. Um, and I think that that's something I want to talk about is how come you didn't just build everything exactly the same? It seems like you have a variation of things. Can you talk about why you're, you know, you're building an A-frame now, you have two tiny homes and you have the sun barn? Right. Um, the reason is I wanted to figure out a way how to make my glamp site unique and uh, differentiate from any other glamp site. And I thought my, my, my cabins aren't the most luxurious. They're not the most, um, uh, well, they're not the most luxurious. They're not the worst either, no. but they're something in, in, in between an, an average glam site, let's mm -hmm. say. So I thought if I'm going to continue to make, um, cabins, what could I do to make my, my place special and stand out? So I was thinking, and this is also before I realized I could cap out at four, but mm -hmm. if I had one structure where each one was a different structure. So I started out with a barn. Then I had a tiny house. Then I thought, oh, I don't want to really do another tiny house. So I'd have a, another, you know, three that were the same. So what else could I do? And I thought about the dome and I thought about the A-frame. And we talked before about um, the fact that I don't really like tents mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the, it just, it just isn't, it just isn't sturdy enough for me. Mm -hmm. And so an A-frame is basically a building as it is. So that's why I went with the A-frame. And if uh, I, let's say in the future, I get another small plot of land and I decide to do another four, I'll try to come up with four other different structures, whether it be something like a, an earth house mm -hmm. or a cave, or what I really would like to do at some point in the future is a castle. And not like a castle that's made with plywood from Home Depot, and then you get like the uh, the foam yeah. bricks uh, that the, that goes around it to make it look. No, I mean like get the rocks from yes. my forest and mm -hmm. cement them together and make like a real castle. Yeah, so, I think that's your art. You know, like you said that you have an art background. I think that is coming into play again because I've been in the sun <laughs> barn and it's extremely unique. Um, so you're definitely not lacking in creativity, and I think that. With these unique structures, uh, it plays a large role. Like you said, like anyone can stay at any glamp site or anything else, but it's having those uh, those things that kind of make you different and, and kind of add a little extra pizzazz to it. Because, you know, the sun barn is so, I call it Instagrammable. 
You know, like who doesn't <laughs> want to take pictures there? But I have a question for you going back to the types of locations and the types of structures mm -hmm. that you can set up. Um, you said that you don't like tents because of the, um, you know, just the, you're really out there in the wind, like you're on the side of a mountain. So I understand that. But do you think that if you were going through the process again of becoming fully legal, chatting with your town, do you think it would have been a different process? Like, do you think that they would have been okay with tents or would they say that's not a glamp site? That's a campground. That's a whole different thing. Gee, I'm not sure how they would have reacted to it because, um, they probably would have wanted the same thing where the, because the big thing is it was all about safety, really. That's what it, that's what's about. Because the town feels that if something were to go wrong on your property, and 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 the fire or the EMS came and they couldn't get to a person because the the, the road wasn't wide enough, or the driveway wasn't accessible, then it could fall, you know, on me, the homeowner, of course. But then the next person will be the town itself. So really, it was it was just about the town protecting itself against anything that might come up because we're doing a business on our, our property. Okay. So I don't think it would have changed much. Um, they probably just would have wanted the same info, like where, you know, and how, how are you going to deal with the bathroom situation? And so mm -hmm. the water bodies, that wouldn't have changed anything. So I don't think it would have been any different because yeah, I'm sure that a lot of some, your, you know, your, your, your listeners would, would want to know that if, if I'm going to get into this and mm -hmm. I'm not ready to build a, a frame or a, a structure like that, and I want to start out with tents, Am I going to have more issues exactly. than, than not? And I don't think so. The only, again, the main reason why I don't do it is just that's something that you have to take up every year and mm -hmm. put away in the winter. And, you know, with the, with a structure that's already built, you don't have to deal with that. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. And then going back to picking which structure, uh, if you could go back in time, I mean, you have multiple different things and it seems like you've thought about new things to build uh you know what would you recommend someone if they're starting off a glamping business what what structure would you recommend them build at the beginning i would actually if i were to go back and, and do it from the beginning after my first building that quirky greenhouse sun barn that that mm -hmm. we call um i thought going forward that oh my next building has to be something that that really you know grabs attention that is more luxurious that uh that is insulated and you know so my, my my second two cabins just were that they're basically little houses they look like little houses mm -hmm. they're built like little houses very high quality much more expensive to build yeah but again what i've realized after the you know three seasons or two seasons is that they, they don't make as much money as that that quirky sun barn so i probably would have just continued building quirky structures uh -huh with uh you know rough cut lumber um the reclaimed and recycled materials i would have just kept building weird and funny shaped things yeah that, i don't know what i would have called it and yeah it probably would have it would have been less money invested to build it probably would have made more money going forward and it would have again had that have you stand out much more than the yeah the guys who are just doing tiny houses and, and a <laughs> I think that is such a crazy lesson to learn. And I'm so happy that you're on the channel telling us that just because that's something that you have to go through to learn. You know what I mean? Because the thought process that you had in the time when you made the decision after the sun barn and, and the greenhouse and, um, is, okay, let me make something that's more sturdy, more, you know, do it on a better level. And it seems like, you know, after doing that, that makes perfect sense. But then you're like, wait a minute, I was making more money with the rough cut lumber, reclaimed wood, you know, just making something so quirky and fun. Um, and that actually, you already answered my next question, which is which one of your structures makes the most money? I mean, I'm certain <laughs> everyone like, I, I'm sorry if I'm getting too into the weeds here, but I like talking about that type of stuff and the business side of things. So it seems like we already know which structure makes more money and what tips and advice would you have for people who are trying to maximize how much they get out of this? You know, we're not running a charity here. It is a glamping business. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to bring people closer to nature, but we all want to make sure it's worth our time as well. So what advice do you have there? Yeah, I also, so if you're going to go that route, I would recommend don't just stop with one. I did my first one to see how it would do and it did well. And so I, I built upon that. But again, I, if I was giving advice, I would say probably build something quirky and small, but build two of them and, 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 and have an idea where your third and fourth one will go. Because now, now I'm like, I'm, I almost feel like I'm playing catch up. Like I know what I wanted to do 
and I, and I, and I tested it out and it, it worked and it's working. But I feel like if I had started with two, then my second year, I would have had three or four already. And by my third year, I might be up to my, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe even already purchasing a second property. So I would say you could build your structures smaller because the sun barn actually is my biggest structure as well. It's 20 foot by 13 foot. Um, but it's, it's, it's not really necessary because the other two buildings are not half the size, but something like almost half the, that size. And you're going to get probably about the same nightly rate as mm -hmm. you would, whether it's, you know, 260 square foot or 140 square foot. And like I say, with the sun barn, the sun barn, not only does the sun barn have a higher occupancy rate than the other two tiny houses, mm -hmm. I can charge more per night, yeah. whether it's the, during the week or during the weekend. So, and that was the other mistake. Why, if I, I figured if I'm going to spend more on the tiny houses, that are more luxurious and have better quality, you know, furniture and all that, then I'm going to charge more. And when I started charging more, I realized I wasn't even breaking like 50% occupancy. So mm -hmm. I lower my rates for those to catch up while the sun barn just, you know, kept along. along. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and maybe also don't forget about the actual outdoor space. Essentially, your little cabin is just where they're going to sleep and be cozy. But if you have, you know, especially if you're in a place that's very rural, you have a nice view. Don't don't forget about the outdoor space. Make sure you have like a, a little deck or a little patio. The sun barn now has like a pretty large stone patio. So I didn't even actually have to build a deck. I just thought I'll just build a frame and just get bring stone in. So it was quick. It's nothing you have to maintain like a deck, you know, each year. With the with the other two tiny homes they mm -hmm. have decks so now every year or two i have to power wash them stain them <laughs> keep them you know upkeep but a stone patio just crushed stone yeah wow it sounds like and and again i'm sorry that you're chatting with us because you've been in the game for a while now um it sounds like you've you know kind of really dialed in your process is there anything else like when it comes to mistakes that you've made, because I joke around and I call it the stupid tax pioneers like yourself, myself, <laughs> we run out here. We're like, oh, look at this new fun, cool thing. We we fall flat on our face. We pick ourselves up. But I think it's our job to tell other people, you know, the people behind us, hey, watch out for that. Watch out for that. Um, so is there any other mistakes that you made and that you're humble enough to you know, talk to us about and make sure that we don't make them ourselves? Sure. Uh, I would say when you're building your structure, one thing I didn't think about, and now I'm also playing catch up with mm -hmm. this, is with glamp grounds, and this is different than traditional Airbnbs when you're, you know, you have a house or you're doing arbitrage with apartments or whatever it might be. Typically, you're going to be renting those to a guest for two nights, a three day weekend, sometimes up to a week. But that's not really happening in glamping. So those of you who are going to go into glamping, you're going to probably have most of your guests staying one night or two nights max. That, that's how it is with mm -hmm. me, especially when, you know, I don't have showers. There's no hot water, really. So it's not where they're going to stay for five days and, and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So um, and with that, that means you're actually cleaning your cabins oh, yeah. almost on a daily yeah. basis. So that's a lot of back and forth. So two things, if possible. Build a little cupboard or closet, even if it's on the outside of your building, somewhere where you can keep all that cleaning stuff, you know, the Swiffer and the dust uh, pan and all that. Because what I'm doing is everything's in my house. So I have to take everything from the house, go to the cabin, clean everything, bring all the, ma the materials back, and then go do the same mm -hmm. thing. So what I'm doing now is I'm just, I'm just stocking each cabin with its own Swiffer, its own dustbin, its own Windex. And That's all a that. great type. The Lysol wipes, so you don't have to keep you know, going back and forth. And the other thing is your entrance to your whatever structure you have, it needs to have some kind of a, a roof. Because what I learned is that on these rainy days, when you're going to clean your cabin, and you get to your cabin, well, you probably might go with an umbrella, you have all your stuff, but then you got to go into the cabin, but then you're got to take your shoes off, your feet are wet or muddy. So if you have a little roof over your entrance, then you have a little spot like that you can keep your muddy shoes and put the wet umbrella and put something and not have to bring it in that gets the cabin dirty after you've done it. So the sun barn now has a little, you know, pavilion right over the front door. I made sure that my A-frame has that and the two tiny buildings, I'm still 
I got the, yeah, I it's funny that. that you said that. That's something I learned very quickly um, at my location. And it's, <laughs> I haven't rectified it just yet. Um, at my tiny little A-frame, you know, the front is extremely flat. And um, even just myself going there when I'm fumbling around with the keys to get into the A-frame. And then, like you said, when it's raining, I don't know where the hell to mm -hmm. put my shoes. Um, so that's a problem that I've gone <laughs> through a bunch. Um, and I've noticed that actually, not even for myself um, going to it or myself cleaning it, but also when guests are there, if it's rainy or muddy or something like that, where do they put their shoes? So a lot of the time, the floors get very dirty just because there's nowhere to put their shoes. And, you know, that's on me as a business owner and operator. I need to fix that. But it's awesome that you, you brought that up because it, it is it's so true um, with your with your sites. Uh, all of them are off grid. Yes. How do you feel about running an off grid glamping business? Because some people, you know aren't interested in doing that. Some people think it's going to be too difficult and some people question, how is it possible? So can you just talk to us about what it's like having three current structures and building your fourth structure and they all are off grid. Do guests come? Do guests have a good time? What is it like? Well, I decided to make my cabins off grid because for me, that is easier than having something that's mm -hmm. on grid. There's no way I could have provided them with electricity or running water without investing. You know, those are those Lux glam sites and the Airbnbs that you might see. But, you know, you're talking when you hear the stories of these beautiful A-frames that have, you know, the full bathrooms inside and hot water and the dishwashers and all that. Those are 100,000 or more to, to, yeah. to build. So I'm building these for uh, one-tenth mm -hmm. of that price. Um, and people... You would think people would, would mind, but they're really not. Because remember, what is glamping? It's glamorous mm -hmm. camping. So it's still camping, but you're just not in the tent with a sleeping bag. You have the comfortable bed. You have the roof over your head. You have a, a fireplace or heat or something. Those are That's what makes it that in-between. So you actually don't want – I think you don't want to go too far and have them have electricity and, 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 and hot water. It's It really is like – the experience of going back to nature and being mm -hmm. in nature, but mm -hmm. comfortably. And that's that sweet spot that, that um, I find that guests, you know, they may not realize, but after the fact, they thought, yeah, that was different. And I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about if there's not running water, how do you brush your teeth? It's just, we take yeah. so much for granted the way, you know, we live in this modern society. And that's what camping was always about traditionally was getting back to nature, going back to your roots, that primal way of living. And so, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cheaper way to, and to build your glam site and it has its advantages, even though the same way I would, I thought my luxurious tiny cabins would, mm -hmm. would be more popular. Yeah. They're not, they're just yeah. little houses yeah. <laughs> in the forest. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, I know that you can have solar power, you can have, uh, propane heated uh, refrigerators and, and propane powered uh, hot water systems. You can have all that, sure, but you have to invest in it. Then you have to pay pay, pay for it, and mm -hmm. then you have to maintain it. And the other thing about off grid is, and again, when you're starting to build, you know, getting your third and fourth and maybe more ca cabins, you have to maintain each one. So each one that has one less thing that can break or needs to be maintained, it's going to be better for you. And um, because again, you're going to be higher turnover. You're going to be cleaning those guys daily, every other day. You don't want to spend an hour a day to try to fix that, you know, propane mm -hmm. powered refrigerating unit or whatnot. So yeah, very like true. I think um, people don't think about simplicity. Um, my glamp site is off grid. Um, and I think it's just very easy for a new person to show up and just, you know, use the things rather than like you said, fiddling around with a propane fridge or those types of things where um, there's just an ease of use for the guests. Um, and I think, you know, as glamping business operators, we need to continue to put the guests first um, and sometimes just look at your operation like you've never been there before. Because uh, a lot of the times, most of these people are new people. Yes, we do get some repeat business, but uh, people will just walk in and just be like, you want to make sure that they can just figure out how to do things. You know, it shouldn't be... Uh, 
If you need a lot of instructions for something, there might be a problem is what I'm saying. Um, so something that you said earlier that I want to go back to, I'm taking notes. Uh, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. I try to be real official with this stuff. Uh, you talked <laughs> often about saying things along the lines of, you know, if I were to buy land again, or if I were to, you know, expand, is that something that you're thinking about? I think I've been thinking about it since, uh, 2020 when okay. the Sunborn went live. Um, it really... And I'm actually not new to Airbnb. I go back with Airbnb probably 12, 13 years already. Um, I first came across Airbnb when I was living in Europe and I was a guest and I was in Turkey. And I, my first Airbnb was like in 2009. And I was like, what is this Airbnb? And I thought, oh, wow, instead of staying, you know, staying in this hotel in Istanbul, this guy will let me stay in his house for yeah. like $13. I got to try it. So, and then actually when I came back, um, I was back in the States for a couple of years in around 2010, 2011, I rented out my own primary residence before I even mm -hmm. had my glamping cabins. So 10 years ago, I actually first got on the platform and was renting my own house. And I did that and had a good, um, you know, good success with it for like two or three years. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, now, I actually lost track about what, what the question was when I went into uh, that. Yeah, Airbnb no, no thing. problem. Uh, so, so the question uh, was you thinking about expanding. Oh, right. So when, when that, when three, so the reason I actually stopped doing the Airbnb in 2012 was that's when I got married mm -hmm. and had a child. So my, my primary residence wasn't free to do that. And for all these years, I thought, oh, man, I, I, there was such good money in that. I wish I could figure out a way to keep doing it, but I'm not going to, I mean, I thought, oh, maybe I will buy another house, get a mortgage and, you know, have the, 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 the get, you know, have guests paying and ultimately paying for the mortgage. So I thought about that route. It just wasn't something that I was ready for or wanted to do. So when I started to hear about glamping in 2019, I thought, yeah, that sounds like something I can do. So mm -hmm. let's try the sun barn. And then, as soon as I saw the Sunborn was successful, I was already thinking about how can I you know, yeah. do more of this? And, and yeah, every day, every other day I'm looking on, you know, yeah. Zillow and <laughs> real estate for new whatever, land. to try to look for that. Yeah. Especially some, if I can find something yeah. that's close by, I'm not one of these big believers in, Oh, we're going to, I'm going to get something in, in, in the smoky mountains and mm -hmm. something in Florida and, I've I've actually gone that route too, Jamie. I in 2006, uh, I purchased a house wow, okay. out in Las Vegas because that yeah. was the hip thing at the time. You know, uh, fastest growing city and this and that. And I thought I could rent it because it was near the Strip. But I lived in New York, and I was still over in Europe at some point, so it was impossible to to to, mm -hmm. to, to manage that. And I ended up losing that house because okay. we had the crisis at 2000. Yeah. So. Anyway, I'm all about doing yeah. everything in your backyard. I mean, yeah, it's nice to say maybe one day, you know, you want to say, yeah, my portfolio, I've got something in Joshua Tree and Smoky Mountains and this and that. But that's yeah. years down the line. Uh, and the first couple of years, you really got to do it yourself, know the ins and outs, and it's got to be where you can. And it, it seems get like to you, it. So, like again, throughout this entire conversation, it's obvious that you are uh, the type of person who wants to roll up their sleeves and just, you know, kind of get to the work themselves. You didn't hire a lawyer, you made your own site plan, you know, you kind of uh, punched fear in the face, which is something that I love to hear. Um, so it seems like you're that type of person, but. Also, uh, about your glamp site, you kind of handle everything from soup to nuts, right? You're the one doing the cleaning. You're the one speaking with guests. You do everything yourself, or do you uh, get any assistance um, from outside? And which one would you recommend people to do if they're starting a glamping business? Should they think about hiring cleaners, cleaning themselves? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't take all the credit myself, Jamie. I do have a very loving and supportive family who do uh, nice. put their share in. Uh, my wife, mm -hmm. my mother-in-law, and uh, my daughter now, who's going okay. to be 10 soon. She's starting to help more. So it, it mm -hmm. is a, it's a family business. Uh, to do this alone would really be an impossible feat. Um, but when I started out, you know, the first one, again, is very manageable and really with where my family helps me out the most is with that daily cleaning because it's like four hours a day to get three cabins ready. So they kind of handle that part while I'm still doing mostly the maintenance and the lawn and the grass cutting and painting and all repairs that needs to be done. 
So um, in the beginning, I really think you should do everything because if you're hiring someone, that means you're paying out part of your profit to do something that probably mm -hmm. isn't necessary yet. Um, but this past year with having the three cabins being run and me trying to build the fourth one, plus all the other, you know, land upkeep, it just was a, a nightmare. So this year is the year that, and my wife has said, you, you got to okay. get cleaner. <laughs> we, if you're going to keep building, we got to get clean. And I agree. It's just, it's not, everybody's afraid. It's not so much that I'm afraid of, of giving, you know, part of the profit out for it because, if, you know, that's going to make you more money mm -hmm. in the long run. It's true. It's just that the, everybody has that fear of giving over something that you know that you're doing yeah. exactly the way you want it. Is someone else going to be able to do it that way? And again, the answer still is probably going to be no, no matter how much you pay them, no matter how good they are, they're not going to spend, like I said, with the lawyers and, and contractors, they're not going to do it exactly the way you want it mm -hmm. and the best way. So to sum up in the beginning, you really should do it yourself. But when you get to the point where you're just exhausted and you just don't have time to do it anymore, that's when you, you probably need to look into hiring. Okay. Some, and then speaking about funds of, of how much things are costing, uh, let's go back to your structures. Um, you have three structures right now. Um, I, I, you probably don't have the exact numbers in your head, but can you tell us kind of how much each one costed um, and kind of like where you think you might have wasted money or where you saved money throughout the building process of each of your buildings? Sure. So the Sun Barn, again, was a kind of a pet project that started out as a greenhouse. So, and I had the advantage at that time, uh, there was a person in the neighborhood who had a bunch of um, rough cut lumber and metal roofing, and he was going to do something with it, but he decided not to. So he sold it to me very cheap. I think it was mm -hmm. 500 bucks, and it included a trailer that he had all the wood piled on. So once I started building the Sun Barn and from start to finish, I was all in for about okay. 6000 and that included the furnishings and the bed and everything. So the original Sun Barn cost 6000 And as I mentioned earlier, the, the best months of the summer, I, I, I make about four, four and a half thousand in the good mm -hmm. months for that Sun Barn. So that's the best ROI yeah. ever. I don't think I'm ever going to beat that. Then with the two um, tiny buildings, those were built right at, the, right at the beginning of COVID, the first year of COVID when lumber prices and all that started to get crazy. Um, but I still wasn't using, at that point, I was still using my local lumber yard that had the rough cut lumber um, that was still way cheaper than going to one of the big box stores. So the two tiny homes, again, all in. And these are the two that I actually hired construction guys to put together. So each building, miraculously, they mm -hmm. came out to 15000 Seven thousand for the materials, seven thousand for the for mm -hmm. the labor and the construction guys. The A frame is a completely different story. I wanted to hire my construction guys again, but they were older guys, and the oldest one was retiring, so he said that he wasn't taking on any new projects. And I looked into some other guys, you know, the young guys, and they wanted more mm -hmm. money than the older guys to do it. And again, I didn't know them, I didn't know their reputation, so. It wasn't something that I was really comfortable with yeah. because I've been burned before. Yeah. Truth be told, I, the, right after the sun barn, I was going to build a tree house and I hired two young kids and they totally yeah. screwed I, it up. I, so I'd like to think of I myself said, as a young no guy. That. I still would go with, I, I like a, a nice seasoned veteran, <laughs> someone who's been like building since before, like power tools were around, someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Like I would, I would definitely go for that type of individual myself. <laughs> yeah. And um, so the A-frame now, that started construction, say, a year, year and a half ago. Um, all the materials for the A-frame, mm, 12, 13,000, plus I'm adding a deck, mm -hmm. which is going to make it 15. So it's still going to cost me 15, and mm -hmm. that's building it myself. And if I were to have the construction guys, it probably would have been okay. another 15. So in today's environment, to have the A-frame which is 12 by 13, um, it would have been 30,000 to have materials and labor. But if you can do it yourself, okay. you'd probably save half, which all makes sense if you look at my, you know, mm -hmm. two tinies, seven and seven, basically. Okay. 
So, so um, with an A-frame, because I have a video on my channel talking about how A-frames, I believe, are a very stupid structure. Um, but the funny thing is that most people don't realize the irony in that video is that I have an A-frame. I love my A-frame. And even in the title of that video, it says a review from a happy A-frame owner. But uh, people don't read in this day and age. But that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> what do you think are some of the pros and cons of building an A-frame? Because I think with every structure, you know, it has its pros and its cons. And I think I know for a fact you're, uh, you know, you like to think of the logistics and the numbers of things. So it's not like you picked an A-frame just because they look nice. So can you talk to some of the thought that came into it when choosing, okay, this next one's going to be an A-frame? Jamie, the reason I picked the A-frame as the fourth one is <laughs> it does. because it looks it's nice. It's the best looking building. That's the truth. Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, it's not, you know, the square footage, it, even though it, it starts out the same mm -hmm. as a tiny house, you lose it when it goes up. Um, it's, it's not a, it's not a comfortable place to, to stay in. Um, but it's all about the, the novelty of it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's trending now. So that's also one of the reasons, but also a little philosophical reason why I did the A-frame is all my other cabins are out in open fields. And the, the, the other part of my property is dense forest. And the only other place I had to build was in the forest. And I was picturing what a tiny house or even the sun barn would look like in my mm -hmm. forest. And it just didn't match the square structure mm -hmm. inside this forest. So I pictured an A-frame. What is an A-frame shape? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like trees, especially the more, the, the higher the roof, the more it looks like it fits in. So when I decided to build the A-frame, besides the things I just mentioned, in my mind, I said, I'm not building a tiny house or a cabin. I'm okay. building a sculpture, a sculpture that's going to look like something that belongs mm -hmm. and fits in this forest. And to me, it does. And I think it looks great. And whether or not the people have, they don't have maybe as much room inside, well, yeah. that's where you <laughs> have to make the, uh, the negotiation. So... Um, that's how I decided on the A-frame. And also going back to where I wanted yeah. one structure okay. of every kind okay, cool. if possible. So, so. let's say uh, a scenario, I'm a, a nephew of yours, um, and I'm about to start a glamping business. Uh, can you let me know what types of things that you would tell to that someone who's someone who's just brand new, bushy-eyed, heard about glamping on the internet, their new favorite YouTube channels, uh, Keep It Tiny, or their YouTube channel that um, you know, I'm adding a description or a link to in the description. Uh, can you just tell me what you, know, you would tell that person early on? Yes. First, I would recommend get involved in mm -hmm. renting something as soon as possible. Jump on the Airbnb platform. If you want to do glamping, great. But if you're not ready, because maybe you don't even have your land yet, or you don't know exactly what you want to do, but you have a house and a spare room, just get on the platform, put that spare room on, get into the feel of how things work. This way you're going to learn how the, how the booking system works, how to manage a calendar, how to do the emails with the guests, actually have the experience of having guests. Like I said, I think one of the keys to my success is I was exposed to Airbnb mm -hmm. way back 10, 12 years ago. So I had a lot of experience with it as both a, you know, a guest and then as a host. So by the time the glamping part for me came around, I already knew how the whole system worked. I actually had a, a, um, a profile with reviews from my previous home, you know, my primary residence. So I think someone starting out, the best thing you can do is get, and that's with anything. Even when you talk about having a YouTube channel, they say, what's yep. the best advice you can give? Just start it. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know what your niche is going to be, you don't have the perfect camera yet, just start it, learn, get into the process, because each step, when you're ready for it, you'll be okay. more ready awesome. than you were. Awesome. Um, one thing I wanted to just go back to the A-frame, because you had asked me this in the email, and I think it's important, is you had worded the question, is people say building an A-frame is easier than building a tiny home. Do you agree or disagree? Okay. And I have the answer. The answer is... The way you did it, because yep. you had a kit. So they came, they delivered a kit to you. You basically had to put it together. The way I did it was I built mm -hmm. it from scratch without any plans, oh, okay. <clears throat> without any blueprints. And it okay. was difficult, very difficult, because this is the first time where yeah. I had to cut things on angles constantly, constantly cutting angles, 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 mm -hmm. tiny house, any house. It's all square. Everything 
fits on top of everything. When you get involved with a tiny, um, with an A-frame, the, like the, the two walls where you have the door, let's say, mm -hmm. and the window on the other side, the studs yep. that go up, when you get to the top, they don't meet the roof flush. They meet it on an angle, and it's the whole thing. And you're trying to space those in between. If you're going to put, like, insulation, it's <laughs> – anyway. Yeah, you learned your lesson. I'll never do it again. <laughs> I'll, even though I've done it, unless – I've learned my lesson, mm -hmm. unless I have plans so I know how to pre-cut mm -hmm. everything or if it's a kit. But to, if you're gonna build something like me, like just you, you decided I'm gonna build a, a tiny house and you go on YouTube to learn how to do it, you don't necessarily need plans, you can do it. But if you're gonna go the way, way of an A-frame and you've never done it, you'd be better off building a yeah, square absolutely. tiny house. Yeah, I think that goes back into the pros and the cons of an A-frame where, you know, it's just like one of the cons, I mean, there's so many pros, but one of the cons is it's an odd structure. And that is one of the pros as well, but it makes it very kind of difficult to, to cut and to build. Cause like you're saying, it, you know, it is very difficult knowing the right angles at each step and at each point. Um, yeah. So uh, people always say that it's so much easier to build. Um, and I think it's very, I think it would be much easier to build for someone who's a builder, but for the average Joe, you know, I consider myself that mm -hmm. Again, just building a square is going to be easier. Like there's no way, no one can tell me any other <laughs> shape than a square would be easier. And it sounds like you would agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, the only exception possibly is the fact that, because am I right? You didn't actually ever have to hold a skill For, saw or cut anything with the, the den kit, right? Yeah, they for the most part, out of the box, it should have together. gone. I mean, there was a couple of things that we had to okay. you know, shave off a little bit to make them fit correctly. But at the end of the day, there was no like measuring okay. and cutting that needed to happen. Everything came pre-cut and we just kind of butted them against mm -hmm. each other and, and drilled through. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and that it's not that cutting the wood is hard. It's 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 the angles, like you said, just where you had to just shave a couple of edges to make it fit together. Imagine yeah. you just trying to get them to fit together for the first time yeah. when they started out as square. So yeah, I mean, I did all kinds of tricks to make things fit. You know, like when I first built the A-frame, first was the found you know the flooring, the foundation, which was a, a perfect rectangle. So I thought, well, like I didn't sit down. I'm not mm -hmm. good at math. I couldn't sit down and figure out how the angles were with the uh, you know, so I just got the two beams and I said, well, if this is 12 foot here and I want my roof to be 12, so mm -hmm. I just lean the two pieces together on the floor and wherever they lined up, I just made the line and I said, that's where I'm going to cut. And, you know, yeah. it was off slightly, but <laughs> you're going to have awesome, that. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, thanks for chatting with me. I'm going to hit the stop button now.